uh, I'd like to start with this slide because it really reminds me to mention the, ex the extreme excitement that we have about um, the advances in, in the last 10 to 15 years because we've had proteasome inhibitors, bortezomib and carfilzomib, we've had the IMIDs, lenalidomide, pomalidomide and others. We now have the first histone deacetylase inhibitor. This, uh, all of this really derived from preclinical work showing that these agents worked alone or together in the microenvironment, which was not true for conventional agents. They went forward very quickly in the myeloma community and were tested in advanced disease, moved to relapsed, and then upfront disease and maintenance, as Antonio told you so nicely about. And we've had 11 FDA approvals in the last decade, uh, and I do think we'll have, uh, perhaps, we've had two this year, we might have another three before the end of the year. So as a consequence, our patients, we can honestly say, have at least doubled and maybe tripled their survival, and we simply don't have enough follow-up uh, with maintenance to, to, to make any further statements. This is the latest iteration of the uh, NCCN guidelines, and I mention it because it's evidence-based uh, medicine. So the first uh, agent that you know that was FDA approved in 2003 was bortezomib based on a randomized trial versus high-dose dexamethasone and relapsed refractory myeloma. The second agents that were uh, approved in combination, again, a phase three trial was lenalidomide dexamethasone. In fact, there were two trials, one in North America, one in uh, outside of North America, presented at the plenary session at ASH, which showed a progression-free survival advantage versus high-dose dexamethasone of 11 months. We then had a third approval of pegylated doxorubicin uh, together with uh, bortezomib. Uh, this was compared with bortezomib alone and again had an extent and a frequency of response as well as a progression-free and overall survival advantage. And the two most recent agents uh, are the second generation uh, IMID, the so-called pomalidomide dexamethasone regimen, and I'll show you the data for that. And then the most recent approval is, in fact, uh, Carl Filzimib, uh, approved as a single agent in an accelerated fashion three summers ago, and then uh, now, just now, receiving approval based on Carl Filzimib lenalidomide dexamethasone, and I'll show you that data, too. We then need to figure out, and I'll show you in the cases, how we think about which of these available regimens we should use. So in any event, once a drug is approved, as you know, then we actually, with our patients, learn how to use it. So bortezomib was approved in 2003, as I mentioned, and it was intravenous twice a week for two weeks and one week off per cycle. But Antonio taught us that, in fact, we could do much better. In fact, we could minimize the neuropathy without sacrificing efficacy he and one of his studies had twice a week bortezomib versus once. When you went to the once week schedule, in so doing, you cut the overall incidence of neuropathy in half and the incidence of severe neuropathy down into the single digits. So he had so nicely mentioned I'm sorry, weekly bortezomib is commonly used presently. The French taught us that instead of intravenous bortezomib, we could use, in fact, subcutaneous bortezomib. Philippe Moreau actually compared at the exact dose and schedule in relapsed myeloma, either the intravenous or the subcutaneous route. There was no difference in efficacy, but in so doing, uh, that is using subcutaneous in a statistically significant way, the overall incidence of neuropathy, and again, if you count grade three as severe neuropathy, was markedly reduced, statistically significantly so, by using the subcutaneous. So it's very common in the U.S. and around the world now to use subcutaneous and weekly bortezomib, and honestly doing that, the, mor the morbidity or adverse effects are markedly reduced, and it's not that common where we have to discontinue bortezomib in current practice. So the first issue is, in spite of all the progress that Antonio told you about, unfortunately, in my view, myeloma usually relapses. And so there's a biochemical relapse, which simply means the reappearance of a protein if it was not there, or a 25% increase in a protein if there was residual monoclonal uh, M component. The issue is it's been the traditional teaching that you wait as you do at diagnosis for crab, calcium, renal dysfunction, anemia, bone disease, and then you initiate therapy. What I would say is especially in aggressive or high-risk disease, 
the reappearance of protein or, if you will, the uh, biochemical relapse, in my opinion, means a very big warning sign to treat early now that we have such effective drugs. In fact, when we see recurrence of disease and we actually demonstrate a real and persistent trend, we will intervene now because, as Irene was talking about, we don't need to wait for complications if we have drugs that are effective and can be used early and actually prevent those complications from occurring.